Okay, our next speaker was the Deputy Commanding General Maneuver of the 1st Infantry Division, former Commandant of the U.S. Army Armor School and Deputy Commanding General for the Maneuver Center of Excellence. He has also previously served as the Deputy Chief of Staff B-357 for the U.S. Armed Forces Command and Commanding General for the 1st Infantry Division. He currently serves as the Commanding General for 5th Corps, four deployed in Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to present Lieutenant General John Kolaszewski. Hey, hey thank, thank you very much. Uh, you guys have me okay? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and keep the video off just because of the bandwidth. And I acknowledge I got about uh, 40 minutes or so to uh, work my way through, uh, provide an update to, to those in the room. So first, thanks for inviting me to speak uh, this morning. I'm currently up in uh, Riga, Latvia, uh, where I am with uh, a bunch of NATO leaders uh, in a uh, NATO course uh, where we're talking about war fighting. So it's uh, uh, very, very uh, interesting, as you can imagine. I think I'm joined by Command Sergeant Major Ray Harris, who's out there virtually. And then in the room, I believe, is Colonel Rob Bourne, uh, the fourth SFAB commander out of Fort Carson, Colorado. And I will tell you that if you get an opportunity to talk to, to Rob uh, about what his soldiers, his leaders have done over here, that's pretty remarkable. I think it would be time well spent. I think also in the room, I've got two BCT commanders. I've got Colonel uh, Pete Moon, who commanded the Raider Brigade, uh, that was 1-3 ABCT, and then Colonel McCarthy out of Fort Riley, Kansas, uh, who commands the uh, Devil Brigade. Just a quick snippet on Fifth Corps, just uh, to kind of help frame this, is so Fifth Corps was uh, uh, established back in World War I and really uh, integrated into the European security environment all the way up until 2013 when it was inactivated. The decision was made to go ahead and add an intermediate level uh, command and control echelon into back into Europe. And so Fifth Corps was activated on 2000, in October of 2020, and then uh, achieved FOC uh, in October of 21 after a, a warfighter exercise uh, that we uh, executed uh, with participants, uh, many of you in the room. Um, we we're responsible for all of the assigned and rotational combat forces in Europe, minus the 173rd. Uh, and I'm the SRO, Senior Responsible Officer, for the ground from Estonia down through Bulgaria. That's kind of the focus area. We are not a part of NATO command or NATO force structure, uh, but we stay underneath US uh, line, a US line and block. So I report to General Williams uh, and then to General Kovoli. Uh, so again, not part of NATO force structure or command structure, but obviously our success hinges on our, our ability to work uh, with national forces, uh, both allies as well as partners, uh, and then NATO forces from the NATO corps to the NATO divisions uh, down through the uh, uh, battle groups. Uh, so I've got four objectives uh, this morning. Uh, first is I want to get you to sign up to join Fifth Corps in the future. Uh, so how am I going to do that? I've got a propaganda film that we're going to show you here in a minute that I think actually it does succinctly talk about uh, the U.S. and NATO's response to Russian aggression pre-24 February and then their invasion of Ukraine on the 24th of February. Uh, and then I want to kind of give you, uh, inform you and educate you on kind of current operations here in Europe. Uh, some initial observations uh, coming out of Ukraine and then again derived open source um, and, um, and none of it will surprise you because our DIRT CTCs have been hammering these uh, observations uh, home uh, for, for years. Uh, but then also we'll open it up for uh, questions. So with that, if we can go ahead and uh, show the video, please. Good evening, I'm Judy Woodruff on the News Hour tonight, Invasion. Russian airstrikes are coming up here in the south. 
Yeah. We were in Germany doing some uh, company level training, focusing on squad live fire, and we, we could kind of feel some things happening to where we needed to increase our readiness. That's where we found ourselves at uh, Aviano Air Base, and that morning the Russians uh, invaded the Ukraine, and, and a couple hours later we're on a C-130 and on our way to Latvia. Right off the bat, you know, we were, we were strangers uh, when we came into Latvia. We immediately gravitated to, to some 11 uh, our Italian companies uh, that were already in Latvia for a couple months. Uh, they quickly took us under their wing, uh, the 11th company of the Bursar Galeri uh, in particular. Uh, within 48 hours, they had us at a joint range where we were doing uh, some uh, cross-training with them. That was super beneficial to the company uh, right off the bat, where we really felt welcome with that NATO uh, main battle group there in Latvia. The ability to mass an entire brigade's worth of equipment in a rapidly deployable fashion with all the proper BII and MTOAD equipment within a shortened time window just demonstrates the Army's ability to rapidly deploy and meet mission sets across the world. This is a very real threat, and we all got to actually be a part of it, not just watch on the news, and that was a, a really rewarding experience. This is what we all joined the Army for. We, we joined the Army to make a difference. We joined the Army for a variety of reasons, but one of the big ones is that we're trying to promote uh, freedom across the world and protect American interests abroad. So our role here in Bulgaria is really to help with the interoperability within the multinational battle groups. Our Bulgarian partners are very capable, but it's always a challenge to onboard and add other nations within a battle group. So the role of the SVAP here is really to help with the interoperability of all the multinational partners within the battle group so that we provide credible deterrence and combat ready forces on NATO's eastern flank here in the Balkans. Okay, it, thank you. Hopefully that, that came through okay. Um, for this particular operation, 173rd was OPCON to us, just, so just a little bit of clarification there, but traditionally they're under CTAP, uh, Major General Tom Wiseman. If I go to the next slide, please. Hopefully you're able to see this, uh, but just a description of kind of our, our current operations. So obviously based on indicators and warnings, our nation as well as many nations as part of the alliance made decisions on redistributing uh, troops uh, along the Eastern flank. Uh, some of those for us came from the United States. Uh, some of those were already in, 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 uh, inside of Europe. Uh, so we got the task to quickly reinforce uh, the Eastern flank. Uh, to assure our allies, because we were unsure of, of Russia's intentions. Um, second is to then also deter aggression against uh, NATO terrain, uh, and uh, again, along the eastern flank. And so that involved moving thousands of soldiers uh, all over Europe, from Estonia all the way down through Bulgaria. Uh, we kind of settled into the mission that you see here. Uh, as the senior U.S. Army Tactical Headquarters, uh, we're focused on, on training, uh, we're focused on increasing our readiness. I mean, bottom line is we've got to be able to present a combat credible force. Uh, we're focused on assuring our allies, determining Russian aggression, uh, while simultaneously reinforcing uh, NATO's eastern flank. 
Uh, and that is true today, just like it was um, uh, you know, seven months ago. Um, uh, in terms of the geometry and how we've kind of established the geometry to effectively uh, provide the forces, uh, credible forces, uh, and to work with our allies, uh, very closely with our allies along the Eastern flank, is I've got the 1st Infantry Division led by Danger 6 Major General John Meyer. Uh, who is responsible for AO Victory North. Uh, and really it's from Poland all the way up through Estonia. Uh, and then also we've done some uh, bilateral, multilateral activities up in Finland. Uh, and we're also branching out into Sweden. Um, uh, then I have got uh, in AO Victory South, I've got uh, Major General uh, McGee, Eagle Six, who has responsibility for Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria. Uh, and you can see kind of the disposition of uh, the US forces by the patches that are there. I also designate uh, on the slide uh, the EFP battle groups. Uh, there is now eight of those uh, up in Estonia. Uh, it's led by the UK. Uh, in uh, Latvia, where I am currently, it's led by Canada. That's the framework nation. Uh, and then in Germ Germany has the framework responsibility in Lithuania. The US has Poland uh, as the framework. And then in Slovakia, it's the Czech Republic. Uh, and then down in Hungary, it's Hungary. Uh, in Romania, it's the French. Uh, and then down in Bulgaria, it is the Italians. Uh, so you'll again see the disposition of forces. Also on the slide, you'll see the 4th Security Force Assistance Brigade and where they are. 19 teams uh, in uh, 10 different countries. Uh, they are focused on um, enabling uh, either a battle group or a allies of host nation defense forces. Uh, so you can kind of see that. Uh, and then Germany in Germany, uh, we've got the assigned brigades as well as some of those that were deployed off the earth, uh, the Army's earth, immediate response force. Uh, in terms of C2, I've got General Meyer in Poland with his two-star headquarters. I've got JP McGee, General McGee down in Romania. Uh, and then I've got a uh, forward command post that is in Poland, in Poznan, Poland. Uh, and then I've got my rear command post that is uh, uh, at Fort Knox. Early in the, our deployment of forces uh, in, in February, March timeframe, I did move a number of soldiers from Fifth Corps into Ansbach, Germany. Uh, so to give us greater uh, uh, command and control capability. So that's kind of the disposition of forces. And you can see the 173rd uh, that is uh, down in Italy. Uh, in terms of the ongoing activities that we currently find ourselves in is force posture adjustments. Uh, so we are much further east than we have been in the past, and it's for obvious reasons. Uh, you know, again, it's to assure, it's to deter, uh, it's really to reinforce uh, the eastern flank with combat credible forces. Uh, so we are working through uh, the um, adjustments uh, to the posture, uh, as well as the introduction of new units into theater, into and then out of theater. So over on the far right of the slide, you'll see some of the inbound units. So we're getting ready to rip um, the, uh, we just executed the transfer of authority from 1st ACB's Combat Aviation Brigade over to the 1st Armored Division's of Combat Aviation Brigade. Uh, we're getting ready to bring in the 101st Sustainment Brigade uh, to give us a, additional operational reach as part of the reinforcement, it wasn't just soldiers and equipment. We also moved um, uh, classes of supply to include class five. Um, and so uh, again, that sustainment brigade will give us, give us greater uh, enabling uh, capability. And then we've got an EMIP that's coming in, an IEW battalion, and then an MP battalion that's coming in. In terms of uh, outbound, as I stated, uh, the first ACB. Uh, so we're working in terms of the ongoing activities of managing and reading through these transitions uh, and then also uh, making sure that our posture is, is straight. I mean, this is a theater uh, where shame on us if we do not build and then sustain readiness for units uh, over here. There's ample opportunities to do so. Uh, while some of the facilities uh, that our allies uh, have might be 
uh, still under development, we can still do you know battalion level training. We can do you know battalion level live fires. Uh, we just got to make sure that we carefully uh, choreograph that um, uh, with our with our um, the host nation as well as uh, some of the NATO entities that are out there. Uh, the second one is is uh, you see Finland summer exercise execution, uh, and so you know we are uh, working with the Finns. Uh, to build collective readiness. Um, and so that was a, a responsibility that we took on and we saw as being important. Uh, as, as everybody there knows is that both Finland and, and, and Sweden have requested to join NATO. I mean, this is kind of a sea change uh, in, in terms of European security. So these two countries uh, are, are, have requested to join NATO. And so we saw a great opportunity for us to go up there uh, to work with the Finns. And as I said, starting to branch out to the, uh, uh, the Swedish uh, land forces. So we're finishing up the summer exercise series uh, with them. Uh, and then that will transition into the fall. And then we're looking at opportunities to conduct some cold weather training uh, with Norway, Sweden, and Finland, all three countries. I think that that again gives us uh, you know, an opportunity uh, to, to better understand how those countries approach, those countries and their armies approach uh, uh, the preparation and execution of, of training uh, in those extreme uh, temperatures uh, and also very difficult terrain. Uh, so we're doing, doing that. I talked, the next one is enabling kind of the host nation mission command. Uh, so this is a little bit higher echelon uh, assistance or enabling than what the SFAB uh, traditionally has been doing. Uh, so it's focused on two-star level headquarters. Uh, and there's a prioritized list of countries, uh, but we see it uh, is, is um, uh, important to help them with the ability to uh, execute effective command and control of, of uh, their own forces as well as be postured to receive any, uh, any movement of additional forces from outside of their country. Uh, and then if there is uh, a, 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 an attack against those countries, they're the ones that really make up uh, the, the contact and the blunt layer. Uh, and then a decision, a national level decision, an alliance decision on whether or not those headquarters get towed into NATO. But they're not operating outside of NATO or the alliance construct, uh, but we see it as an opportunity to, to, to improve their effectiveness, uh, which is what they're asking us to do. Uh, and then also it will help us uh, as well as the alliance as we look at um, you know, security and we look at defense. Uh, and so uh, John Meyer and JP McGee, uh, Danger Six and Eagle Six have that uh, as a responsibility. And so seize those opportunities working with those countries. It also uh, helps us kind of force the issue of interoperability. I'll talk about that here in a minute. Uh, but again, uh, enabling that host nation the mission command capability. The next one is, is I tell you that, that our nation uh, is very fortunate, um, is that uh, we've got you know, centers of excellence like there at, at uh, Fort Bain. Um, uh, so as we look at kind of strategic weapon systems, I tell you, I'm an individual military education and training is one of those. Uh, and then also foreign military sales. But on the IMET piece is to, to those uh, uh, foreign officers that are in attendance, uh, either a foreign liaison officer or an actual student, thank you uh, for volunteering to come to the United States uh, and to serve in, in, in uh, uh, some type of capacity there for getting or one of the other uh, commands. Um, I, I can't tell you, you know, uh, the number, I mean, it's, it's too great a number of people that I've bounced into as I have traveled all over to Europe that are graduates of, you know, our basic courses, our captain's career courses, CTSC or war colleges. I mean, it's pretty impressive. And so that really helps facilitate some of the human interoperability, that relationship development. And so I'm at an FMS. So the, the, the Polish land forces um, uh, have requested, and it was approved, to buy 250 M, um, M1 Abrams uh, SEP V3 tanks, M1A2 SEP V3 tanks. And so we are working with the Polish land forces 
as well as also with the PM uh, to set up, set them up for success. Uh, and so we have held uh, kind of, we had a three pronged approach to it. Is one, we did an operations summit uh, where we brought in um, uh, a bunch of the leaders of the Polish land forces, um, you know, four, two SARC uh, uh, officers. Uh, we brought in um, also some of their colonels and lieutenant colonels. And we sat side by side with the 1st Infantry Division hosted it. And we did, it was a, about a three day uh, seminar where we talked about really the Dotlam PF uh, 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 implications of fielding the Abrams tank. Because it will change, I think, the way that they train uh, as well, way, well as the way that they train and educate uh, their soldiers, uh, their leaders. And so we're following that up with the logistics uh, focus, sustainment focused uh, summit. Uh, and so that was the kind of the first lead in. Uh, and then we've got a apprenticeship program that First Infantry Division is running, where we brought in Polish uh, uh, officers and NCOs uh, and embedded them into the brigades. Uh, right now it's 3 4 ABCT Steve Capehart. Uh, and where they're sitting in the S3 uh, shop. Uh, working with the um, brigade master gunner and the brigade S3 on how to develop a gunnery program, a gunnery strategy, uh, and then actually, you know, getting it resourced and then actually executing it. Same thing with uh, some of our exercises, you know, they're in the top or they're in the field trains. And so, again, this apprenticeship program is important, and I appreciate Tom Felt, General Felty, uh, and, and now General Buzzard uh, for um, uh, helping us uh, with getting uh, uh, Polish officers into the basic course or the captain's career course, uh, as well as with an eye towards the master gunner course. Uh, we think that those will be very important. Uh, so again, the apprenticeship program is kind of that second prong. And then the third prong is the delivery of instruction uh, on the actual tank itself. Now, we're doing the B2. Uh, because we don't have the B3 available to them, uh, but PM Abrams uh, is executing that training. And so uh, we see that as, as important uh, an effort. And so uh, First Infantry Division has it. There's a battalion commander that's responsible for uh, enabling uh, that effort uh, in support of uh, PM Abrams. Um, the next uh, bullet down, you'll see battle group development. So I think uh, many of you are familiar, 2014, uh, Crimea, uh, Russia invades Crimea, uh, annexes Crimea, uh, the, the alliance responds and provisions for new battle groups uh, along the uh, northeastern flank. And those are the ones up in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland. Um, uh, as a result of Russia's uh, incursion and invasion into Ukraine on February 24th, uh, what started as a U.S. bilateral uh, effort with the four countries in the south, Slovakia, uh, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria, it then transitioned to multilateral, and then it is now a NATO effort. Uh, and so um, there's now eight total battle groups. Uh, and so you can see down at the bottom that we are making progress uh, in, in the battle group development for the southern four, southeastern four. Um, a battle group will have between five and eight nations uh, that will um, uh, be part of the construct. Uh, it's about 1,200 or so um, uh, soldiers um, from those countries. And you can see with the description of the makeup, you know, I mean, you know, tanks, uh, infantry that is both mechanized uh, or motorized. It could be also light infantry, uh, fires. Um, air defense and logistics. And the fires could be self-propelled. Uh, it could be, um, you know, uh, 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 not um, like, you know, triple sevens or one one nighters. Um, uh, but again, it is a combined arms element, usually tucked underneath uh, the host nations, uh, a brigade from the host nation with a tether to a, a, a NATO division or a NATO core. And so we have seen some, some progress uh, down in these uh, uh, four uh, southeastern battle groups. Uh, so the battle group in Slovakia uh, should declare um, uh, FOC. Uh, so there is a readiness evaluation prior to the declaration of FOC. 
uh, this fall. Uh, same with Hungary. And then this winter, uh, we expect to see Romania and Bulgaria declare FOC. Uh, right now, in the uh, uh, amongst the eight battle groups, we are uh, the framework, as I mentioned, uh, in Poland. So we've got a, a U.S. Stryker battalion uh, that is the CORE of that battle group. Uh, it will change out and become 38 Cav from 31 Cav um, uh, here uh, next month. Uh, and then we have companies that are in the three of the four battle groups down in the south. The one where we're not integrated right now is uh, in Romania. Uh, we are working bilaterally, uh, but not a part of the uh, battle group there. But we are seeing some, some progress. And then Fort SFAB is helping with that transition from being an armor battalion or an infantry battalion to the development of a staff that expands its focus uh, and develops additional capabilities and capacity to a combined arms battle group. And so again, uh, we're seeing a, a lot of uh, a positive uh, momentum. Um, and you know, this is again, you know, something that is is recently developed. I mean, if you were to go back to last fall, you know, there had been some discussion about needing to do that, but um, there was absolutely no decision. Uh, so you know, we I think helped spark the interest uh, by physically moving forces uh, into this uh, important region. Uh, and we built off that bilaterally to multilaterally in NATO. Uh, and you know, I, I know that the countries in the region are, are very excited about that. Uh, and there was a lot of commentary that came out of this um, uh, during the Madrid summit uh, earlier this summer. The last one is interoperability uh, with allies and partners. Uh, again, you know, interoperability really three domains: human, procedural, and technical. Um, human and procedural is, is one that I think that uh, uh, we have done pretty well with. Um, uh, the technical interoperability is one that, that uh, we, we have made progress uh, since uh, the winter, uh, but we've still got some work to do. But it is encouraging. I mean, you know, as silly as it might sound to some, I mean, I can now, uh, on something called the Mission Partner uh, Environment Network, I can do and send an email to somebody that's on NATO secret or on Polish mission, the Poles, their mission network. We weren't there last fall, last winter. So, so we're seeing it and that is an ongoing effort. I've actually reorganized my staff to get out to them. Uh, in terms of over on the right side, you see four bullets. Um, in terms of what has been, I think, uh, critical to our successful execution of the task that we've been assigned or the mission that we've been assigned. One is APS. Uh, you saw Peak Moon 1-3, over 10,000 pieces of uh, equipment that were issued uh, by a 21st uh, TSC, really ASC, uh, under uh, Army Material Command. The second is ammunition. This is, we have you know, ammunition that is uh, uh, pre-positioned, uh, but we ended up moving it. Uh, and I tell you that uh, it was one of the lessons learned in terms of you know, going from unit basic loads to combat configured loads a uh, lot more real estate required. And so, so we're making some, some adjustments, but I think that the APS and the ammunition stores being present uh, here in theater great, greatly uh, enabled uh, the response uh, and that reinforcement. Um, large scale exercises, just like in the Pacific and Europe, we do the Defender Series. Uh, and that has really helped us in terms of force projection, uh, as well as also um, working through uh, clearances, uh, and um, uh, uh, either airspace uh, or ground clearances. Uh, it's, it's enabled us to work closely with allies and partners. Uh, and it really has helped us rehearse, you know, what we actually end up doing uh, along the Eastern flank. And so the Defender Series has been very important. In terms of force posture, uh, as I said, that, that is one of the, the tasks that we're undertaking now uh, is to expand and improve uh, some of the forward operating sites that we occupy. But for instance, down in Romania or in Poland, um, I mean, there are, there are forward operating sites where we can flow forces into, kind of think of them as a bunch of lily pads, and then we can force project regionally from there. And so that posture has helped us uh, uh, quite a bit. I am in relationships, and I, I kind of beat, uh, uh, beat on that earlier, is just the importance of uh, relationships. Uh, so again, I think that that has helped us 
uh, in terms of getting our set established, uh, and most importantly, assuring our allies, deterring further Russian aggression, uh, and really uh, helped uh, build lethality, work in progress, but build lethality uh, along the eastern flank. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, um, and really this is just some observations, open source observations uh, from Ukraine. Um, that I believe won't surprise you, as, as many of these have been illustrated, you know, if you talk to uh, our CTC COGS uh, or CGs or those that have been in OCT, I mean, it's no surprise. I mean, you know, we've been, you know, putting these in our, our green books uh, for years, but they did play out. Um, and, and so then there's some, some you know, adjustments uh, based on some changes with technology. Uh, but I'm not going to cover too much of this because I think General Donahue is next, and, and I think that he'll probably expand on this. Uh, but you know the importance of, of small, agile command posts uh, that can quickly be established and then uh, disestablished and, and um, uh, displaced. Uh, the EM signature um, and, and trying to reduce that, uh, and then having some redundancy. Uh, again, you know, it's something that, that our uh, COGS and our OCTs um, and our DIRT CTCs will, will continue to remind us and they'll actually show us, you know, hey, here's your end signature. I mean, we can see this from quite some, some, some ways away. Uh, and if you can be seen in, in, in your stationary, then obviously, uh, then you can be attacked. Um, use of communications, uh, you know, non secure communications is, is a vulnerability. You know, as part of the interoperability in this theater is we've got something called tactical voice bridges, which allow us uh, to, you know, think of it like a retrans. As we talk on a U.S. radio, and, it, and then we are able to uh, move that signal onto um, a, a national uh, pick the country, their system. So we've got two radios connected. We talk on our SINGARs, and then we can talk to them on their national system. Um, and then there is crypto so that we can talk secure. Uh, but again, uh, you know, it is a vulnerability. Uh, mobility leads to survivability, talked about that. Uh, combined arms uh, and combined arms training. Um, you know, you've got to work this through training and repetition at the, at the smallest levels. Uh, UAS, um, you know, in terms of targeting effort, in terms of uh, helping with force protection, in terms of discerning adversary intent. Uh, you know, it is, it is obviously important. Deception and camouflage kind of ties into a number of the bullets that I've already described. The contested airspace. I mean, there is no free chicken, right? Um, and we see that at our dirt CTCs as well. Sustainment and logistics. It does absolutely enable uh, operational release uh, reach, uh, but you've got to secure it. Uh, and you've got to make sure that uh, however you secure the lines of communication, if it's episodically, uh, then, then you do so. Um, and then you've got to look at building some redundancy into your sustainment plan and then information operations. Uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, information out there uh, in terms of OSINT specifically uh, to describe a kind of uh, uh, what is going on. Uh, so kind of next slide, please, in closing uh, for, for you know some of the takeaways for me personally is that I mean, if you're getting ready to deploy this to the theater or a different theater, is you got to understand the environment that you're going into. I mean, if you're on the earth uh, and you're starting to get indicators and warnings, and you need to make, take steps to understand that, that operational area you might be uh, going. History, culture, if there is, is alliances or treaties, uh, uh, if you are going to be uh, under uh, a, a NATO head, headquarters, what that means. Uh, you've got to make sure that you have trained for that particular theater. Uh, you've got to also you know, make sure that you, you understand the maintenance architecture that is there. You've got to understand the importance of the allies and partners and what they bring to the table. So really understanding that environment is important. You've got to be ready. Um, you know, uh, Pete Moon and uh, the Raider Brigade, when they just got back from Korea, uh, popped up onto the earth. Uh, and he and his leaders thought that the next major task for them was to uh, enter into modernization. Uh, and then they found themselves on airplanes on APS and then executing all the way up to a uh, DIRT CTC brigade level uh, exercise. Uh, so you got to be ready as people and your equipment. 
Um, you know, you got it. Part of that readiness is your soldier family readiness groups. I think you understand that um, uh, for, for sure. Um, you've got to understand that you're a leader, a mentor, and an ambassador. I mean, you're, you know, you're wearing the cloth of the nation. Um, and so enforcing standards, uh, being cognizant of uh, your partners, allies, or partners' capabilities uh, and limitations, uh, and working with them to build that collective lethality, that collective uh, readiness. Understand that you are an official uh, and that people are, are watching you. Uh, and you've got adversaries out there that would love to drive a wedge between you and a and host nation or you and an ally. And so just uh, making sure that you understand that. Uh, and then you got to be ready to tell your story. Um, I think that uh, it's important because, you know, if you don't drive that, then somebody else will. Uh, and again, our adversaries like to uh, uh, try to put out misinformation uh, and disinformation. So you got to be able to tell your story. Um, I think that's important. Uh, and in terms of mission command, uh, is making sure that you're empowering your non-commissioned officers, uh, and you're, you're again uh, focused on you know you as a leader uh, directing the organization, um, uh, and that is through direct and then also organizational leadership. Uh, and then I think the last part is build that team. Uh, that team you know might be your you know platoon, it might be you know your your company might be your battalion or brigade, but then look at how you pull in uh, others uh, to be a part of your team. And I think that that will help make you uh, successful. I know that it has here. Uh, so again, it's been an honor to uh, uh, address you this morning. Again, you saw the fifth core patch uh, in the video. I tell you that, you know, really fifth core is, is uh, been a part of it. But really, I mean, there is a, a zillion patches that are underneath that, some of them over top of the US Army, Europe, Africa, UCOM, uh, Department of the Army. Uh, so a lot of people uh, help enable the US response, help enable NATO res responses, and, and we've been uh, proud to be a part of that. So with that, I've got, I think, a couple of minutes for, for questions, so I will turn it over to you. Sir, thank you so much for your presentation. Your information came across clear and well synchronized with your slides. So we're gonna manage a uh, slight delay here as we take questions from the audience. I write them down and communicate them to you. So you may hear us uh, fall off for short seconds. Those in the audience, uh, at this time, uh, please raise your hands uh, so we can have some questions lined up for Lieutenant General Kolchevsky. With that, sir, I'll ask the first question of today. The U.S. Army is a pending publication of FM30. Considering your current mission command systems and interoperability with NATO partners, have you considered any challenges to achieve convergence at the decisive point between the theater army, core, an MDTF, if you were forced to conduct operations in a disrupted, degraded, and denied environment. Over. Yeah, you're coming in a bit choppy, but I think I understand the gist. Um, so we were very lucky in terms of, uh, as we did our train up, uh, we were able to work with our higher headquarters, US Army and Europe Africa. Uh, they acted as the CJ clip. And so our communications with them uh, has been uh, uh, robust. Uh, and it, we've also built in redundancy in terms of, uh, we've got MPE, uh, we've also got some of the national systems like CIPR. Uh, same thing down um, uh, within the core itself. We run both MPE uh, as well as, uh, uh, we've got lower TI, um, and uh, you know, um, with uh, JVCP, uh, we've also got uh, SIPR, tactical SIPR as well as uh, strategic. And so we ever exercise that frequently. Now, where we have seen some, some progress, but we still have work to do, is being able to communicate effectively uh, with uh, our allies. Uh, and so that is where you know, the technical interoperability uh, is, is becoming more and more decisive. 
uh, because we think that we've got to get that during competition uh, and, and work that um, uh, prior to an Article 5 or even an Article 4 declaration uh, so that we've got an effective uh, war fighting net so that as we transition into an Article 5, uh, which is in the collective defense, um, is uh, uh, important. So, so we still have some work to do. We have organized for mission. Uh, we are seeing some encouraging signs from being able to federate MPE, which is the US system, uh, with uh, some of the national mission networks. Uh, and so I think that that needs to be, you know, interoperability does need to be, uh, you know, uh, a part of the FM3.0 uh, uh, description of the operating environment to find ourselves in working with allies and partners over. Thank you, sir. We'll take our first question from the audience and then I'll read it back to you over this uh, communications forum. Stand by over. Paddle number three. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Captain Chris Wilson, current student at Triple C and former 2S FAB team leader. He mentioned how 4th SFAB. As you're transitioning, uh, if uh, Rob Bourne, Pete Moon, or Colin McCarthy have anything that they'd like to add um, at some point, you know, if, if, if possible, give them the floor. Or we can direct one of your questions to one of those three. Nice to me. Uh, just kidding. Go ahead. So you mentioned how 4th SFAB has enabled your operations there. I was wondering if you wouldn't mind iterating uh, what specific capabilities or limitations they have had with regard to your mission there? All right. Hey, thank you very much for the question. So um, as, as far as uh, fourth ASFAB's value proposition uh, to the operations on NATO's eastern flank, um, capability and capacity, interoperability, and then shared understanding through persistent presence. Um, and I would say that our pacing items are communications, the advisors, and our authorities. And so understanding the authorities that enable our operations has been very important, whether it be 1251, which is linked to certifications and exercises, uh, whether it be M333, I'm sorry, triple three, which allows us uh, a lot more flexibility uh, for long-term missions that we're executing in Latvia and Georgia. Uh, and then just building trust with the relationship. And so um, I think one of the things that we've had to overcome is many of our NATO allies have experience in Afghanistan and Iraq. And their um, projection of what advising is on our, for, on our leaders was something we had to go overcome. But I think we focused on interoperability and readiness and communicating that we're here to, to help U.S. forces as much as we are to help the NATO forces. And I think that was extremely important to overcoming some of the bias our allies had when it came to the advisement mission. And then I think the, um, the crisis focused efforts and created uh, coherence and I think motivation to work together. And then the large scale combat operation exercises you know, they're, they're really not even exercises, they're campaign rehearsals, um, have really helped build cohesion and an understanding of what we can bring uh, from an interoperability and a capability and capacity perspective. Panel three again. Uh, good morning, sir. Captain Sedlacek, MCCC student. Um, I'm interested in what the critical focus areas are of our relationship with NATO as doctrine evolves and the operational framework expands in the contact layer. The, the critical what? Our critical focus areas, sir, or some critical focus areas. Okay, thank you. So our next question is also from the uh, captain's crew, of course. And the question is, as uh, the area of operations expands and we gain more information about the operational environment, what are the additional critical focus areas that you're currently thinking about over? 
Yeah, uh, good, good, good question. And so one is is working with uh, U.S. Army Forces Command um, to make sure that you know, those units that are aligned against the theater, um, we do anything and everything we can to help prepare them for it. Um, and then for those forces that are deployed into the theater, uh, that they've got the uh, platforms uh, to build readiness while they're here. Uh, and we uh, have aggregation plans uh, in place so that we quickly uh, can aggregate uh, units uh, if required to transition from competition or crisis uh, towards uh, something uh, in, in a different uh, realm. And so, again, it is making sure partnering with ForceCom that, that make sure the units understand the operating environment. Uh, so we've put together a, a guide uh, to help introduce uh, people coming into the theater uh, uh, to Europe, uh, and then you know looking at you know the development of their training plan uh, and the integration tasks necessary to get them closed in theater uh, and then um, ready to fight, uh, and then again. Uh, settling on operating sites where they have the capability to, to, to build the readiness. Uh, they've got the force protection measures that are in place uh, to defend against uh, air or a ground threat. Um, and that they understand the importance of working with our allies uh, uh, and partners uh, in uh, the countries that they would uh, find themselves. Uh, so really it is you know, the human and the physical terrain uh, and, and helping with the uh, preparation of that. Over. Sir, thank you so much. Our last question for today will come in from uh, an online question. The question is, has 5th Corps established an innovation cell similar to 18th Airborne Corps? Great points in seeking a way to connect. I support the DEVCOM C5 ISR Mobile and Survivable Command Post program. Over. Yeah, thank, thank you for the question. So the short answer is, is no, we have not. Um, now we do have, we're in the process of getting somebody from AFC uh, to, to work with us, um, as well as we have done some things with the 75th Innovation Command, which is the US Army Reserve Unit. Um, now that said is that we do have an interoperability lab in Poznan that's established where we are experimenting kind of skunk works type uh, to get after the technical interoperability uh, with um, uh, allies, uh, in, and in particular uh, with, again, the NATO uh, entities. Uh, and then we're working country by country to, to build out, you know, be it uh, C2, fires, logistics, I mean, you, you name it. And so not to the, to the level that 18th Airborne Corps has, uh, but uh, we do have a, a, a small technical interoperability uh, skunk works uh, that is established, uh, and we are, you know, partnered with the 75th uh, uh, Innovation Command, um, as well as uh, starting to look at AFC and some opportunities to kind of build uh, that out. Uh, over. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Sir, thank you for taking tonight the, the time today to present this information to the Maneuver Center of Excellence and our audience. There's many more questions, both online and in the audience. We're gonna take those questions down and Major General Buzzards asked us uh, to provide that to you. And if your team to provide feedback, uh, that'd be wonderful. Let's give uh, Lieutenant Colonel Polishewski a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs>